So let's look at another sort called counting sort. Um, so the basic premise of counting sort is the fact that it does in fact do counting. It's going to count the number of times an item and number occurs. Um, so uh, this is another non-comparison based sort. Um, it's an alternative to the stable sort we used previously. The example we'll look at is uh, specifically going to be used to sort uh, positive numbers within a, a certain range. So here's pseudocode for counting sort. Uh, this is based on our uh, recommended uh, supplemental reading book, Introduction to Algorithms by Corman. Uh, it's a slight variation on the, the version presented there. Um, first of all, let's talk about what goes into and comes out of this algorithm, and then we'll talk about the basic structure of it. So uh, first off, it's got an array of integers uh, with n different values. Uh, we have some k that we know. So k basically is the maximum value in the array. And we're going to assume positive values. So imagine k is 5. That means all of the elements in our array are going to be numbers 1 through 5. And in this case, I'm even going to uh, discard 0, although it's pretty easy to account for that as well. When our algorithm's all done, it's going to put the uh, values of a into a secondary array called b, and it'll put them in there in ascending order. Okay, so this algorithm is kind of broken down into four major phases. So uh, each of the phases is kind of uh, controlled by a for loop here. So you can kind of see one, two, three, four, four loops. So I'm just going to look at each one of these. Uh, so the first one is about initializing an additional array called c. Um, so C is really about being used primarily to count things initially. Our second loop is actually specifically about that. It's going to use C to count each individual uh, value in A to see how many times it occurs. So in a second we'll work through an example and initially I'm going to kind of think of C as kind of like a tally table. So I'm going to draw C so it looks some, something like this. We'll have our indexes and then over to the right I'm going to basically keep a tally of the number of times a value occurs. So if the number 2 occurs twice, I'd kind of put two tally marks there. Um, so you can see in code here, it's, it's just literally counting. It's taking some value from A. Uh, it's using that to look up something in C, look up the current count, the current tally, add one onto it, and then update that spot in our tally table C. Um, Okay, the third phase of the algorithm goes through and it kind of changes the meaning of this uh, C array and instead it's going to be something that's referred to as a prefix sum. Basically it's going to be a count of the number of things that come before that value uh, in the array A. So for example, the, uh, the box that corresponds to 3 here will basically be a count of the, the number of things that occur before the value 3 up to and including the value 3 itself. We'll take a look at this as, as we move on to our example. So that's kind of the third phase of the, the process here is kind of updating this tally table to suddenly become a prefix sum that somehow tells us something about the location of where items belong. Okay, the fourth phase then uses that updated uh, table to figure out where to put things back in our B array, and as it's placing things in the B array, uh, it also is updating this tally table and kind of decreasing um, the, the values that are stored in it. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to an example. Okay, so we're going to go through an example of the counting sort. Um, so first of all, the problem's set up. So we've got an array A here. Um, a happens to have seven different values in it. I'm going to go ahead and put indices off to the left. Uh, for this example, we'll use one based indices, but this can be generalized to use zero based indices. Um, so we've got our array B. Uh, so our array B is going to be the same size as the output, so it also will have uh, uh, indices one through seven. Okay, um, so those are uh, two of our three inputs to our function. If you remember, the last input was k, and it's basically the largest value that exists in our array. So looking through this array, 3, 1, 4, 1, 2, 2, 1, uh, it looks like 4 is our largest value. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and keep track of that. Our k is 4. Uh, by the way, we've got a total of uh, 7 values, so n is 7. Okay, let's go through the different phases of our algorithm. So the first phase sets up the array C. So uh, the array C is basically for keeping counts of the values in our array. So again, we've got four different values in our array. So it's going to have indices 1 through 4. 
And basically this is, represents kind of a tally table initially. We're going to go through this and uh, it'll keep track of the number of times each value occurs. Okay, so the first phase of our algorithm is about initializing C. We've created C, and then it would go through and initialize each box to be a zero. Since I'm initially going to use this keep track of tallies, I'm going to just leave them blank. So let's move on to the second phase of our algorithm. The second phase of our algorithm iterates through A, and each time it encounters a value in A, it'll look up the corresponding row in C and increment it. Again, I'm going to be using tally marks initially. So uh, the first item in A is a 3, we go to uh, box 3 of C, and we've currently seen 1, 3. Uh, the second item in A is a 1, we go out to box 1 of C, and we've currently seen 1, 1. Uh, the next one is 4, we go out to 4, we've currently seen 1, 4. We go out, uh, then the next item is a 1, we go out to box 1. We've already seen 1, 1, so, uh, but we'll put another tally mark there. We've now encountered a total of two different 1s as we were scanning through our array. Uh, then, with, uh, then we move on to the next item, we get to two. Uh, we haven't seen any of those yet, so we put our first tally mark in there. Oh, there's another two. We've now seen two of them. Uh, and now we get to a one, and we've now seen three ones. So we're now essentially done with the second phase of our algorithm. But in reality, our algorithm's keeping track of these, uh, not with tally marks, but with totals. So we've seen three ones, two twos, a single three, and a single four. Okay. okay, the third phase of our algorithm transforms what these mean. Currently, they're counts. We've seen three ones, two twos, one three, and one four in our input. Now we're going to transform this to represent where the last of a particular value would be. So we want this first box to represent where the last one will go in our array. So if we've got three ones, the final one will go at index three. So we'll leave that box alone. Now let's think about our twos. Uh, so we've got a total of three ones and two twos. So between the ones and the twos, we've got a total of five things in our array. And the final two will go at index five. So uh, basically that's just the running sum up to and including this box. So 3 plus 2 is 5. Our final 2 will end up being placed at index 5. Now when we get to 3, there are a total of 5 elements that are going before any of the 3s. There are the 3 1s and the 2 2s and a total of 5 elements. Um, so currently this, this box right here represents the total number of elements that come before 3. So the 1 3 uh, will end up going at uh, position six. So we'll go ahead and take what's in box three and add it to box two, and replace box three. Okay, uh, then the process repeats. When we get to four, there are a total of six things that'll come before our first four, and there's a single four, so our final four will end up uh, being in box seven. So that takes us through the uh, third um, phase of our algorithm. Now the fourth phase is trying to assemble what goes in our final output array. So the fourth phase will be working backwards through our A array, and it'll be taking items from our A array, using the positions that we've calculated in our C array, and placing the items in B. Okay, so working backwards, we get to the item one. Well, this is the last one we would have seen in the A array, so we need to figure out where the last one in the B array belongs. Well, we can just look that up, so index one, so we use this value as the index into the array C. So we say, hey, where does the, the last one value belong? And it says, oh, index three. So we'll go ahead and take that one and copy it over and put it there. Okay, uh, but then we have to update this. We've placed a uh, one. So the next time we place a one, it's gonna go before the one we just put down. Okay, then we'll back up in our A array. We'll get our next value. We've got a two. Okay, let's look that up. Two belongs in uh, box five out here. So we'll go ahead and copy this two over to box five, and we'll now update this count. So the next time we encounter a two, it'll go in box four. Okay, moving through our A array. Oh, a two. Let's, uh, so two belongs in box four. So we'll go ahead and put a two in box four, and we'll update this count. And the next time we encounter a two, if we do, which we won't now, um, uh, it would belong in box three. Okay, next value, uh, we get to a one. 
Uh, so uh, we'll look that up. Oh, uh, one belongs in box two. And if we encounter uh, another one, we'd want it to go in box one. Continuing back up our A array, uh, we get to the four here. So we look it up, four belongs in box seven. So we'd copy it over and uh, then we update where the next one would belong. So the next one will end up going in box six. Uh, then we get to the one here, we look it up, one, oh, that belongs in box one. So we copy it over, we would update our counter. So if we happen to account another one, we'd know where to put it. Um, okay, and then our last value, three, we look that up, three belongs in box six. We put that out there, we update our counter. And we're done. Okay, so notice that we've we've got items in our array. They are sorted one on one, two, two, three, four. Uh, we haven't lost anything. We've got the same number of ones, twos, threes, and fours that we had in our input array. Um, it may seem awkward that this goes backwards through this array, and I kept referring to this as copying an item over. Uh, basically, what we want to do is we want to maintain the idea of a stable sort. And if we copy an item over, and if we work backwards in the way that we just did, uh, we'll actually ensure that when we move items over, this last one ended up here, the one before it ended up there, and the one before it ended up there, are going forwards, the first one ends up in the first spot, the second one ends up in the second spot, the third one ends up in the third spot. So if we wanted to ensure, if these had additional details that went along with them besides just their numeric value, and we wanted to ensure that this is a stable sort, we've essentially done that. Okay, so you may be wondering what the time complexity of this is. Uh, so there will be a PDF uh, linked with the video here, so you can actually go through the analysis yourself. Um, but I'm just going to go through some of the highlights. So uh, we've got this loop that takes place k times. Oh, we've got this loop that takes place n times, but everything that's going on in that loop appears to be a constant time operation, array access, array assignment, and an addition. Uh, we've got this loop that uh, is 2 to k, so it's approximately k times. And again, everything that uh, takes place inside of there is array access and simple arithmetic, so we can assume that that's uh, constant time operations. Uh, and then we've got this uh, stuff that goes on down here, so it goes from n down to 1, so that entire loop takes place n times. And all this stuff inside here is again just uh, array access, so constant time operations. Um, so it looks like we've got uh, k plus a k plus an n plus an n, uh, so it looks like big picture, that's uh, n plus k.